Hey everybody, this is Michael T. Bradley. With me today, I have a special guest, Colby R. Rice. Uh, Colby is another author that I have worked with. Colby is the founder and CEO of Rebel Ragdoll Press. Colby is a uh, novelist, screenwriter, kitchen ninja, all sorts of exciting things. And Colby is here today to talk with us about Ghosts of Koa, which I was the narrator on. Uh, Colby, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. <laughs> I love how I make it sound as if like I have an actual show. <laughs> it's all you. It is your show. <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, uh, brought to you by Huggies. Uh, so, so Colby, I've, I've got a number of questions here, but first of all, why don't you just uh, tell anybody who might be listening, just give us a basic sort of outline of Ghosts of Koa. Okay. Well, Ghost of Koa is, I guess, what I would describe as urban fantasy thriller. At least that's what I was aiming for. Set in a post-apocalyptic Earth. Basically, um, after everything has been destroyed, you see this rise of a new civilization that call themselves Azures. And they have mastered the art of alchemy and have been doing so for a long time. However, there's another group on Earth that unfortunately did not have the access to um, alchemy or its inst institutions, and they call themselves the civilians. So you have these two civilizations that are trying to coexist, but the Azures are busy trying to take over um, and basically assimilate forcefully the civilians into their society so that they can pretty much have dominance. Um, and the story actually pretty much centers around the main character, and her name is Ezekiel Jahara Annan, and she's basically a teenager um, who is trying to survive and help her family to basically keep afloat while this impending conflict and war is going on between the civilians and the Azures. And she herself is a civilian. So we get to follow her through basically um, her steps of survival. Uh, and also, it's she's the main character, but then we also follow three other main characters as well, which we'll get into, I assume, at some point in the interview. So. Probably. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> and I think it's also important to note that this is the first of a series. Yes, it is. Um, the The novel Ghost of Koa is actually the first installment of 10 planned novels. So it's a, it's a decology, and the entire series is called The Books of Ezekiel. At least that's what I hope. I mean, I've written the first one. The second one is pretty much halfway done, so we'll see what happens with that. But that's the plan. And, and and now just to just to be like boring and pedantic here, uh, just just to make sure, if you look on Amazon, uh, the Kindle print formats, you will see that there's a volume one and two. But those are volumes one and two of book one, correct? Yes, that's true. It can be a little confusing, but yes, they are the same book. Okay, so <laughs> I'll go ahead and start in with the uh, the questions now, and obviously not reading from uh, a giant page of notes here but uh, <laughs> all right so colby you've said before that you were kind of frustrated about the hunger games because if i was reading the comment correctly it might look like you're trying to rip it off along the way now that i've seen the trailer for whatever the new one is mocking jay uh or mockingbird uh whatever that one is <laughs> mocking jay I, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, uh, is it Mockingbird? I don't even it's know. I <laughs> See how closely you I, follow these things. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I, I tried reading the first book, uh, because somebody told me about it because I was a huge Battle Royale fan, mm -hmm. and I, I thought the books were just horrible, so I never, uh, I never bothered with the movies. But now that I've seen, um, the, now that I've seen the trailer for that, maybe you were talking about something else here, but I'll give you a chance to answer all that. Okay, um, no problem. Um, so, I think there are many influences, obvious, in Ghosts of Koa, but the main thing I kept thinking about was the original RoboCop, specifically of a review I read that pointed out it's a specific type of sci-fi, a kind of Jeremiah dystopia. I'm wondering, why sci-fi? Why not, say, an alchemic fantasy series, or just, you described it as urban fantasy, but it's still definitely post-apocalyptic as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so why not an urban fantasy setting that's modern day, in which just alchemy is real? Or why not a modern day, near-future setting sans alchemy altogether? Uh, 
Mm. Uh, in 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 summation, <laughs> the TLDR <laughs> version of that. What made you want to use an imagined future to showcase the issues that seem front and center in this book? Um, as you mentioned, the uh, civilian azure divide, which is very much a class divide. Mm -hmm. Um. To be very honest with you, because my writing process is relatively organic, basically the entire series started off as a page of notes. Essentially, when I started writing the books of Ezekiel, it was originally planned as sort of your, I guess, run of the mill, I hate using that word, but run of the mill fantasy deal. Like you create the world, you create the creatures, the people. And how I started is I actually started creating the guilds that were, that are eventually going to become a part of the entire series as a whole and basically how alchemists are trained and, and so forth so far so all that shit <laughs> basically i'm trying to like get that out um and i mean essentially as i put the story together and i started to discover more who the main character was and what drove her i figured that the class divide would be the best way to display the relationships that are important, I guess, to me in in today's time. Um, so I have to, to be honest with you, I guess the world creation was sort of a little bit separate from, <laughs> from my character creation. I just found a way to try to merge those things together. I guess I didn't feel that a modern day setting would be the most interesting setting in which to set my characters because we kind of know this already. I, I feel as though we understand, I guess, generally the class divides between the rich and the poor and the middle class or what have you. But I sort of wanted to experiment a little bit with how those things played out in a world wherein essentially, at least according to one group of people, access to resources really is just a few steps away via a study of alchemy as opposed to all these different tiers that we have today and see how people still struggle with different levels of i guess socioeconomic oppression in addition to this magical world i i think it's funny the way that you couch that at the end there because you said uh, at least according to uh, the azures uh, the um, um the access to the resources is just a short step away and i mean that's it, it felt very similar uh, to the way that, for instance, many right wingers today say, you know, just just get a job, you know, like I put myself through college and da 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 da, and uh, not really noticing uh, the challenges. Like, for instance, there's a scene in the book where Ezekiel uh, does consider becoming Azure, um, and the process to become Azure is so obviously. Uh, uh, prejudiced against anyone who doesn't have money, time, references, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that it, it's a joke to think that it's open to everybody. Right. But, but of course, they, they keep saying, it, saying it's open to everybody because right. technically it is. So mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. Also interesting because when I interviewed uh, Kevin uh, about Tales of the Incorrigible, he said that he started with a world and then kind of filled it in with characters, which sounds kind of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, pretty um, much. It's, you're sort yeah. of like grabbing at straws a little bit um, sometimes as a writer. <laughs> There's a point at which you get kind of desperate for ideas. So when you stop, like when you're, at least for me, I had to think about how to make this, I guess, relatively accessible to anyone who's reading it now. Um, and I guess find the a pathway from this from our world into this imaginary world that people would kind of understand a bit more because to me the magic and the alchemy and the demons and all that that's really important and interesting and I like writing that stuff but really if there's no connection between I guess our world and that world like who really cares if there's like fucking dragons like killing you know what I'm saying like that's nice and right. everything but how do we see ourselves reflected in that kind of world? So I guess I was thinking about that. So I'm assuming like book four is going to be called fucking dragons and shit like this. <laughs> Which so so and just out of curiosity, is this heading towards a uh, uh, like a like a everybody fights in the gladiatorial pit? It, it, was that the Hunger Games comment, or is it 
more about the class divide, which, as I say, the, the Mockingbird trailer really seemed to push far more. It's Mocking Jay. No, oh, it is Mocking Jay. I thought you were mocking me for saying Mocking Jay. No. Is, is, is... Okay. No, um, no, we're not heading towards some gladiatorial bloodbath. I mean, as much as I love those kinds of things. Julie grinned off her embarrassment and hugged her. Zeka hugged back, tight. Don't worry, Julie whispered. I'm safe. I've made sure of it, okay? Zeka nodded in response, her throat tight. When the civic economy had finally collapsed five years ago, they both left school to go work at the lakeside diner. But life had soon taken them to different careers. Julie's parents had been social workers and had gotten caught in the middle of some flying shrapnel on a peace mission in the beyond. Koa had bombed some Azure councilman's motorcade, and while the Azure himself had survived, but many others didn't. Word had it that Julie's parents had been on the sidelines of the procession, protesting Azure occupation of civic domains. Bombs never had the right names on them, though. Zeka would always give Julie her tips to help her out, but it wasn't enough. Eventually, she had to leave the diner and support herself in a job that had single-handedly paid the bills. Beautiful Julie. Her innocent eyes, sweet face, and Midwestern charm was what got him but it also made men think she was a punching bag. She'd come over to Zeka's house one too many times with bruises and sprained limbs. Her ballet buddy since kindergarten, best friend since grade one, and partner in forced truancy since grade six. One of her most loved friends, lost to the war and the beyond, just like she was. I spoke of the issues brought up in this book. The biggest one to me seems to be classism and the kind of inevitable outcome of the erosion of the middle class. A term that gets bandied around a lot in this book and is important in different ways is haram, basically something that is unclean in the eyes of God. What fascinated me about this is that these characters who are struggling to put food on the table are so concerned about this concept. And it made me start thinking about noblesse oblige, which is French so I can't pronounce it, the obligation of the rich to take care of the poor, and how the world you present, and arguably the world we live in, has turned this notion on its head. The rich do not take care of anyone but themselves, while the poor feel a kind of noblesse oblige towards God, if that makes sense. I'm wondering if you could expound, expound on that thought a little. To be very honest with you, the concept of haram, as far as I was thinking when I wrote this, belongs solely to manja. Um, Ezekiel's little sister. Um, and I don't think, I mean, at least from my perspective, I know that the way that a writer interprets his or her, her own work is going to be different from how readers interpret the work, um, which is fine. It's fantastic. But in terms of feeling obligated to God, uh, Manja, because she's so kind of like cute and innocent, and I think her parents and her family have really struggle to help her have some sort of a semblance of a happy childhood, some kind of innocent childhood. I feel like they've done a lot to cushion her against the crap that's happening in the world, which at least from her parents' standpoint means like throwing her into sort of uh, a faith-based way of living. Um, and so in a lot of ways, even though Manjeb and Ezekiel both face all of these dangers and horrors, I think in a lot of ways, because Ezekiel has to be the main person and the main protector, Manja is allowed to, to a certain degree to sort of keep this, I wouldn't say happy-go-lucky, but keep a more optimistic perspective. Um, so in terms of the noblesse, noblesse oblige, I think that um, for the most part, the civilians in this novel are just so concerned, are more concerned with day-to-day -day survival and not, I, I guess, not being in any way similar to the people who are trying to take them over, which might in, cer in a certain way force them to take a, a, a sort of higher moral ground. Um, but I never, when I was writing this, I never really thought about trying to, for example, you know, make the civilians adhere to, you know, let's 
<laughs> do things to please God or let's do things to be better people. It's sort of more how can we eat and how can we <laughs> stay away from being Azure as much as possible. Um, whereas in, the Azures, on the other hand, are, I, I feel like are sort of, not all of them, and we'll see, you know, we've seen this, I, uh, at least I hope, in Ghost of Cold, but also we'll see this more in the series. Um, a lot of Azures, they, they, they just don't care. They're sort of like living their day-to-day -day lives, sort of like how we do. I mean, um, anyone who's privileged in the world who doesn't really have to think about survival just kind of goes along. Um, so they don't really think about the people who are struggling so much. Um, whereas others, like more of the top tier people, top tier Azures, are deliberately trying to overtake the civilians. So I don't know. For me, in, with the Azures, it, you have the two camps people who are basically trying to run them over, the civvies over, and then you have people who just are living in, in bliss. So I think it's interesting that you interpreted it that way, but I don't think I did it intentionally when I was writing it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah you were bringing up. Uh, counter examples and uh, especially Caleb I think would fall he he does seem to have a, a noblesse oblige he's he's mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know he's he's even kind of at the, uh, towards the top of the azures uh, mm -hmm. in, in a way uh, but he's like you know let's just get the job done essentially. Mm -hmm. so you'll find that a lot of elements in this novel and I hate admitting this publicly to the world we're just sort of like I like this concept <laughs> or yeah. Manja is Muslim. So what are the, what are the values that she would be concerned with? What are the pressures that Ezekiel would be facing being raised in a religious household? That's sort of a mixed, mixed religious household that she's trying to contend with in addition to surviving. That's sort of basically how I was dealing with this, you know, I guess. So it kind of, yeah. some, of, some, of some of them are really randomly thrown in. Others are very deliberate. <laughs> Relating okay. to the idea of uh, this is something uh, that this character would face because she's Muslim, you know, yeah. or would would have in her mind, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, going back to the concept of the Hunger Games first, that story, while dealing with some fairly intense issues, so I've heard, um, um, is yes. firmly young adult. This story is not. Um, and I would not recommend play. it for children <laughs> at all. <laughs> Manage your dick out of our business and we'll do just fine. Funny how a woman has nothing to say when she has an azure dick in her mouth. Your time in the street has you smelling yourself. While you still walk this earth and your asshole points to the ground, I am still your mother. Something I found interesting in this story that's rife with class warfare is that while our main character and her family are people of color, not once is there a racist term used. And so see, this, this, this comes back. See what I mean? This comes back to mm -hmm. things that would be in their lives that they were dealing with, I assume. Right. I think the only term we get is a character uh, who's part Japanese is at one time called a mutt. Yeah. I'm I'm curious, uh, I'm assuming this was a conscious decision. Can you talk about why you chose not to cross that line? Yeah, um, because, okay, so the first book, if I really were to assign a primary theme to the first book, I mean, you, you obviously have nailed it already. I wanted to sort of focus more on the class struggle because the race issue um, is definitely is there. I'm not gonna say this is gonna be a series that doesn't deal with race. But the history of alchemy, because I've created almost, oh my God, like a two to three hundred time, two hundred, two to three hundred year timeline for the beginning of alchemy up until like present day and even in the future in the series. Um, the way that alchemy began was very much based on race. Uh, I, w I wouldn't say based on race. I would say very tightly intertwined with the concept of race. Being that, at least in today's world, in many different societies and contexts, race and class are, you know, they, they're intertwined. I mean, you can't really deny that so much. Oops, my laptop plug just came out. Um, so because alchemy, it originally was sort of really tightly intertwined with um, racial and cultural differences, which will be explained in the second book, I tried my best to save that particular theme for the second book. Um, in terms of Caleb and him being called a mutt, 
that, and I'm going to try to explain this without revealing too much, but that is steeped more in not so much the fact that he's half Japanese, half Italian or whatever, but more so that uh, his mother was not necessarily on the up and up <laughs> in terms of like keeping it all in the family. So it's more about this is, you know, for Caleb's father, it's more about he is not my son uh, as opposed to, you know, this guy is not full blood Japanese or what have you. Um, Got it. Yeah. The Italian dude that that that's a whole, has a whole history behind it, but it didn't really matter what race he was. And for, for me, it was just more so he's not royalty. Whatever. It's 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 closer to bastard than right. uh, than than mixed exactly. mixed heritage exactly. Yeah. And obviously, you kind of keep circling around. It, it's it's sometimes difficult to deal with some of these questions when you're at part one of ten, and right. we're not wanting to even spoil what's in part one. Right. So. Right. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, that's uh, true. Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> I forget that sometimes <laughs> people who are listening to this might not have already read the book, which is probably most people. So remind yeah. me. <laughs> for those of you who already have purchased the audiobook on Amazon, iTunes, or Audible, thank you. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, Michael's so... awesome. Michael rocks. <laughs> I'm allowed to say that. I think. Yeah, keep that in there. Don't right. edit that out. Okay. I'm if if I'm still alive at that point I'm very I'm looking very much forward to doing book 7 dragons and shit. So okay. um, oh, no, no, it was fucking fucking dragons and shit. Uh, it's fucking shit up. Kenji walked over. As he approached, Caleb could see his eyes go wide with shock. Holy shit. Yep. Kenji Sato, pleased to meet you, man. We've heard a lot about you out of the 52nd. Didn't expect you to be a kid though. No offense. Kenji said warmly. Caleb smiled back. None taken. Also didn't expect you to be one of us. Kenji smirked and pulled down his bottom lid. Nice job sliding through the ranks, kid. But maybe they saw the cream in your blood, eh? For a second, Caleb paused, surprised at the crude reference to his ethnicity. He was Japanese, at least on his mother's side, but he was built mostly like his father, whose Italian name and physical features he'd carried throughout most of his life. Not many people put a fine point on his background, or even cared, but Kenji apparently did. Not too many of us in alchemic law enforcement nowadays, Kenji continued. Nice to see a fellow yellow, even if you're only a half-breed. Eh, <sighs> woof, Caleb snorted. Didn't know we were still counting quadroons in 2155, but thanks for noticing. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> two, two of our main female characters can turn metal to fabric and back again. Is this perfect Yonic imagery? Whether yes or no, was that why this power was chosen? I'm going to guess yes. Uh, <laughs> and... and and my assumption is that it's going to play in more as it goes along, but uh, why that power as opposed to anything else? Um, so that actually also comes out, uh, it comes from a, a few different places. First of all, I do want to make a clarification because maybe this wasn't really um, clear in the book, but it's actually only Zeka who can turn metal to fabric and back again. Manja, she can control metal. So she can't like change it. And I actually chose those particular powers for two reasons. The first one is based mostly on uh, a concept that is found in alchemy, which is called the cycle of transformation. And it's more of a theoretical concept than anything else, but I've changed it into a more physical concept, obviously, because you want to like see cool shit going on <laughs> in a fantasy series. So, um, right. With the cycle of transformation, basically you have like the four elements, earth, fire, water, and wind slash air. And it's said that you, sh you, can be, you, you would be able to move from one element to another, um, that you have to go in certain directions. And I've sort of modified that for the series as a whole. And that was a very, I wouldn't even say subtle, but it was the beginnings of an introduction to sort of explaining how the cycle of transformation works. Um, and for Ezekiel, it's important for her because her particular powers, um, 
are a little bit more involved and advanced in terms of how the cycle of transformation actually works. And that's all I'll say about that. Um, so that's the first reason. It's based on that concept. And the second reason why I gave them the powers is because the Diku and Manja often are together. And so I felt the need to have them work together both magically in addition to just um, having them having a synergy as like sisters because they have I feel like they have like a really tight bond I feel like they sort of know what the other is thinking and like how to react to one another how to keep each other in check and everything and I felt that it just made a lot of sense um, for them to have complementary powers but at the same time and I guess I'll give like a hit number three and this is again me trying to avoid a massive reveal there's something very particular about manja <laughs> that we will find out later uh and actually we'll find out in book number two um that'll explain everything about her and why she has those powers so that's all i'll say about that those are i guess the two okay. reasons plus two a i'm curious what music you listen to while writing uh, back when i used to write i used to pick what i'd listen to based on what style of story i was writing so as to help set the mood in my head do you listen to anything in particular while writing Ghosts of Koa? Yeah, actually. I listen to a lot of rock. Um, a lot of rock, a lot of trailer music, like that like highly dramatic trailer music you see for like all these superhero mo movies and stuff like that. Um, and lots of Dead Can Dance. <laughs> a lot of really like, I guess, I don't know, cryptic mood setting stuff uh some 300 music occasionally but mostly rock and heavy metal um lots of angry rock like stained disturbed um some lighter a little bit lighter like evanescence i mean they're kind of they're not nearly as dark as stained but things like that like a lot of alternative music and stuff like that it, it helps to set the mood a lot so i i, I... I, I, I totally thought you were going to say it was a lot of Nina Simone. Uh, <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> occasionally, occasionally. But when you're like running from, you know, monsters and shooting, she doesn't, I mean, she can set a certain mood, but yeah. <laughs> right, more right. More punchy, more angry. What made you think of the music question? I mean, do you usually ask most of your authors about that or we're just curious in terms of how the scenes are written you know this is set pretty far in the future and i thought it was interesting that a uh, uh i'm trying to remember manja's what four or five something like that yeah, she's like, um, yeah four going on five mm -hmm. um uh i thought it was interesting that you chose to have her listen to somebody from our past even rather mm -hmm. than say uh, a teeny bopper group from 2242 or wh wherever the I, I totally don't remember dates but the uh, you know from uh, from somewhere right. kind of um, uh, around their time so that was that I, I thought it was interesting that you took pains to mention a an artist who we would even um, uh, know so. yeah well she Nina Simone is just good like <laughs> I mean not to hate on you know NSYNC Britney Spears Gucci Mane, Ludacris, all these people, <laughs> all these random, I mean, not hating, it's just, I like music, I guess, and maybe this is one of the reasons, I like music that I can really, that actually means something, that has like a message that can, I mean, as angry sometimes as angry rock can be, they, I feel like some groups, um, particularly like Evanescence too, and they're not like the, the best of the best, I think they're good, but um, they use like a lot of really great metaphor um, when they talk about whatever it is they're talking about. Um, and that's not just to them, but there's another group that I really like called Ra, um, who aren't, I don't think are really as popular, but they're really good. They're really great um, rock artists, rock slash alternative. Um, and they just have some shit to say. Like a lot of artists, I guess, I feel more, that are like way more contemporary. Um, and I mean like this kind of stuff that people who are younger than me are listening to. I feel like a lot of those artists don't really have much to say, you know. So I'm still keeping my ear out, but we'll see. Yeah, my my favorite uh, piece of work when it comes to brilliant metaphors warrants cherry pie. So uh, yeah. that's... <laughs> <laughs>
So yeah. my final question. Yes. Let's take a moment to gush about my favorite character in this book, Sal Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a bastard. <laughs> and not not necessarily in the mutt sense, though maybe that's coming up. Uh, as I've told you before, my notes for him consisted of two words, the devil. <laughs> I, <laughs> did Sal have any particular inspirations? Or uh, I, I phrased that badly. Was there anything in particular that inspired the character of Sal? When I finished my first draft, and rather, no, that's wrong. When I finished like my second or third draft and I handed it to my editor, my editor basically was like, oh, this is interesting, but I have no clue who the bad guy is. Is it Zakaya? Is it Vassal Moss? Is it Sal Morgan? Like we have a bunch of assholes, basically. We don't really know which one to focus on. So I felt that the person who had the most impact directly on Zeka's life at that point in time or who had who had, had the most impact directly had been Sal Morgan and she like knew him a little bit more personal than everybody else so from there like I had he's a minor character actually he wasn't this psycho asshole <laughs> stalker um that he had uh, that he turned out to be in the actual book itself um so basically I ended up taking my editor's advice and just picking him out of everyone else I guess because maybe I found him not only to be the person, again, most impactful, but also I found it to be the most interesting. As I wrote him a little bit more, I guess, again, and it's going to sound really schizophrenic, but the character just sort of decided how he was going to develop. Um, so I'm not really sure if he had any influences. I mean, do I know anyone in my life who's like a Sal Morgan? Thankfully, no. <laughs> I think I'll be fucking terrified if I did. <laughs> um, but uh, he basically, because he has, I will say this about him. The main thing that influenced the development of his character, aside from everything that I said, was um, his particular history and his agenda, uh, which... I won't reveal entirely right now, but his particular agenda in the novel and in the series as a whole is what drives him to be as demonic as he is. Um, so th I say that to say that there's some things about Sal Morgan that we don't know yet that we will find out about. Um, and I guess the, that's where all of his influences came from. But I have no clue where that motherfucker came from <laughs> out of my imagination. Yeah. I yeah, I I I that's I'm glad that you don't have anyone who he was pulled from. But I was just I but I figured if he was, there would be a good story behind that. Oh uh, my god. It's a, <laughs> that would be like some good therapy as well, Jesus. Writing right, that. right. Like it would it would I you know, I would have not asked that question, or I would have edited out that question if your answer was like, my father. You know, <laughs> so. A pretty face that does not beg, Sal said. I'm intrigued. He reached out and caressed her cheek, pushing a loose braid back behind her ear. He lifted her chin, forcing her to look into his face. She couldn't turn away, so instead she focused on the long, thin scar that ran from his temple to his jaw. She fixed on it, drawing strength from knowing he had once felt pain. His power came down on her with ten times the force. She let out a low whine as her limbs began to fold down harder, forcing her knees and forehead towards the floor. She crumpled, and Sal's grip tightened on her wrist as he forced her arm and body in opposite directions. "'Please, my lord,' Mama whispered as she stumbled forward, falling on her knees. "'She's just a child. She meant no disrespect. She's tired from work, is all.' "'I realize that. No need to be dramatic, Mika.' <laughs> but... You know, uh, it's interesting, though, that your editor told you that because one of the things that I thought was very uh, effective for ramping up the tension, especially in the second half of the book, is the feeling that uh, essentially you have Zeka at the center of everything that's going on, and it feels like she is just in 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 a pool in the Amazon surrounded by piranha. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, because uh, you've got all these characters who wish her harm or incarceration for different reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the people who are on her side by three quarters through the book are not necessarily going to let her go, if you will. Right. Uh, and on the topic of uh, Zeka being surrounded by Piranha, I also kind of wanted to mention you really push home the fact that Zeka is an innocent caught up in the events around her. And there are a couple of lines uh, that I kind of ribbed you about because they seem to uh, uh, take that to a, a crazy extreme. Mm -hmm. Now, I was curious... Um, and again, a lot of this is 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 spoilers, but just uh, uh, kind of trying to paint broad strokes here. Is Zeka kind of a Virgin Mary role to Manja's baby Jesus? Was that the feeling that you were going for? <laughs> I laughed so loudly when, I, when you first asked that question. Um, not at all, honestly. To, when I'm writing Ezekiel... Um, Zeka, rather, I should probably use her use the nickname. When I'm writing Zeka, essentially, I think I ask myself two questions, and uh, and maybe I sort of ask myself this question a little bit a little bit too much. But one, what would I do being in that situation? What would I be thinking? What I, what would I be feeling? Um, what would I be doing? Right. So all of her actions, I guess, how she's sort of portrayed. The way she thinks through things, the particular thoughts that we're tuned into, like, you know, when we know that she's having a direct thought. Um, I guess that's sort of what, that's a reflection of what I would, what I think I might do in that situation. Or number two, what would anyone being in Zeka's position, being young and being vulnerable, what would their real life situation be? Excuse me. Now, I don't really know because thankfully I'm not in that situation. And I would hope that, you know, to a certain degree, people reading this or anybody reading, anybody not reading this wouldn't have to find themselves in that situation. But um, she wasn't deliberately, <laughs> she wasn't deliberately positioned against Manja as sort of like this, these super like hyper innocent sort of Christ-like Creatures. It was just sort of like there. I mean, in the world in general, there are a lot of kids who are unfortunately caught in the midst of war. And basically, I feel I feel as though it being in that situation, although I wouldn't know from firsthand experience, it's probably most likely a day to day logic difference. Um, sort of, you're thinking about what your next step is going to be, and trying to. I would hope like. To certain, to a certain degree, hold on to whatever values it was that your parents taught you. I mean, kids don't come out of the womb basically like feeling hatred and anger and things like that. I mean, for the most part. And so I think a lot of it, <laughs> I guess, references to her innocence, whether direct or indirect, or are more sort of just trying to acknowledge the fact that she's trying to hold on to a part of herself while also just surviving on the day to day. Now, I'm not exactly sure, like certain parts that you mentioned that I, I guess I won't say because I don't want to spoil them, but certain parts that you mentioned in the novel <laughs> um, that uh, are sort of an overstatement of that. Um, I had never seen it as that, I, I've never, I never saw it that way before because as a writer, when you get entrenched in your own work, you sort of, like, everything is sort of, that whole world is sort of normal to you. You know, you, it's harder to see it from an objective perspective. Um, and other examples that you gave of, like, the innocence being um, really, really put out there, I was just like, oh, really? I didn't realize that anybody would interpret it that way, <laughs> you know? Um, there was a particular line that one of her, like, colleagues or comrades in the end makes um, that you referred to, the cherry line, that had nothing to do with, deliberately trying to state her innocence. It was just, it, it said more about that particular character than about what I was trying to do. But I mean, with the summation of what she's been through and how she's been portrayed throughout the entire book, I totally understand like why you interpreted it that way, so. 
Got I have it. a really roundabout way of answering your questions. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I have obtuse questions, perhaps. Okay. So, uh, you know, at the beginning, I asked you for just a kind of uh, overview of Ghosts of Koa. Can you give us kind of an overview, I guess, you know, as spoiler free as possible uh, of the whole uh, decology, decology? Like what, what's the, uh, you know, kind of what what can we look forward to in a grand sense without going into a lot of details? I'm going to frame it in terms of, I guess, the hero's journey without going through all the 12 steps. Are you familiar with um, that book, The Hero's Journey at all? Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, okay. The first book essentially was just setting up, it's all about setting up the world, right? I mean, which I feel like is probably the hardest part um, of writing a, a, any series because you have to sort of get the elements in there and let people know what it's about without basically solving the, saving the world in the first part. So we're just setting up sort of everyone's lives, but particularly Zeka's life. The rest of the series is going to be, oh my gosh. Um, there's a, <laughs> there is a journey. She's taking a journey, um, in order to rectify the, the world as it is. I mean, I don't really know how else to explain it without like, cause I, you know, I don't, because it's about her, but it's also about like other characters from their perspective. Um, it's kind of hard to give that overview without, I mean, we can look forward to more guilds. Let's, let's put it this way. More guilds, more alchemy. Uh, looking into alchemy more specifically in a much more detailed way, it's going to move from the background a little bit more to the foreground. So um, I guess I, I wouldn't liken it to Game of Thrones because, I mean, it, Game of Thrones is fantastic. I really love it. I don't know how you feel about it. But uh, the way that he does it, he focuses more on, like, the character relationships from what I've seen than he does about like, hey, we can we got wizards and dragons. I mean, that's sort of more of like a backdrop. And it's sort of similar to what I'm doing in the books of Ezekiel, but it but the the magic essentially will come more into the forefront. Um Zeka makes a lot of changes in her character that I can't really go into. And then we're gonna see some a lot of new people and we're also gonna be able to see not only it, for the civilian world but a very in depth look at what goes on in the Azure world, because not everything is as hunky dory as it seems, as they're portraying themselves to be. So, in 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 this book, we see, I, I guess I would say, Zeka's story is maybe sixty seventy percent of it, and then the rest is uh, a lot of the side characters. Mm-hmm. Will I, I'm assuming, since it's called the Books of Ezekiel, we'll be following Zeka's. Uh, uh, she'll she'll remain uh, the main character through the series um i guess my question on that so like for instance in a later book might we have side stories taking place within the halls of dace the halls of air etc etc is that kind of uh what you're going for or is it more that the even the main story might start rolling through those halls and so on the main story is definitely going to let's let's put it this way we are going to have side stories that like roam into the halls of dace uh, you know, roam into a guild, for example. Um, not anyone who's like super minor, but anyone who has sort of like a uh, moderate to main role in the story is probably going to get a storyline, whether minimal or um, whether it's going to remain minimal or become like one of the main ones is, has yet to be seen. But no one in the story um, who does not have a direct connection to how Ezekiel's life is being affected, no one, no, they're not going to get, like, a storyline. Like, the people in the first book, eventually you see them converge to a certain degree. Um, and you see them converge, like, very much with Zeka like, at the crosshairs. Um, so if that's not happening, that person is not going to get a storyline, I guess. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so... I'm uh, personally I'm rooting for Wavy Davy to uh, come into <laughs> come into the forefront and be be possibly the major uh, the major player in 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 at least half of this decology. <laughs> All right, well, Colby, is there anything else that you want to say uh, in closing? Uh, yeah. Um, I wanted to address your um 
question because I didn't really answer it about like the yonic image, <laughs> yonic imagery. <laughs> Go for it. I loves me some yonic imagery. <laughs> no, I'm think I I thought about it and I'm still thinking about it. I didn't deliberately avoid it, but I don't. I guess I'm sort of wondering um, where you interpreted that because I I. No, I wasn't thinking that at all in terms of like <laughs> Well, and and I I assumed uh that it wasn't uh purposeful, but I felt <laughs> okay. it was so appropriate that I had to bring it up because um and especially when I think it is actually Wavy Davy uh who has um uh, some I I swear uh, there's some sort of interaction between them because Wavy Davy's always trying to get into her pants. Uh, uh-huh. And um, uh, I swear he has some line about like, you know, you you took, I, you know, in 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 jive terms, you took away my <laughs> erection. Um, and and it's the fact that he said that uh, that totally made it click that her changing something hard. <laughs> Into something <laughs> limp and back and forth with ease, uh, you know. And and we even get a we even get that line from uh, someone else. I I believe it's Vassal Moss at one point who's like, you know, that's really advanced. <laughs> that's advanced. That's advanced beyond a sixteen-year-old girl's normal uh, uh, abilities. And and I just. Um, and and those two things I thought really made it stand out to me, and so I started to wonder: was this in fact purposeful? Because uh, assumedly, you know, uh, we see a, a lot of different powers in the book, and um, uh, you know, I, I'm sure alchemy, as taught by oh god, I, I, what what was his name, John D, and so on and so forth, had lots of various rules, but considering this is fictional and in the future you really could have done whatever you know there could have been the alchemical power to make dragons appear you know what i mean for uh uh so i thought well considering you could have given her really any power and uh was that purposeful so that's where that came from (laughs) no i like it though actually the imagery that deals with um like the <laughs> the the essence whether male or female um that actually i mean i focus a little bit more on like i guess female imagery like later in the series but um i did not think about yeah i had i i it didn't it did not occur to me at all when i was writing it like that this was um more of like on along the lines of like yonic erectile related kind of stuff i mean i like it now you're giving me ideas i'm like hmm but um no yeah (laughs) yeah yeah and that's um uh, that that's what i assume that if it was something you were thinking about it was something that after a first draft you were like i could play that up you know but (laughs) um but still it, it 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 did seem to come up enough for me that i thought it was worth asking about and and here all uh, for anybody who hasn't bothered to look it up, you know, I, I guess specifically the word yonic uh, means um, shaped like uh, female genitalia, and I'm using it in the more larger sense of uh, f- uh, femininity, if yeah. you will, that, that, that ability, ability to change from <laughs> <laughs> steel to fabric. Yeah, from from hard hard to limp and back again uh, to be more <laughs> to be more metaphorically vulgar, I guess. Yeah. So, all right. So beyond that, <laughs> anything else? All right, Colby. Well, thank you so much for joining me. It's been fun, and um, everybody, uh, feel free to go take a look at Ghosts of Koa. Uh, there will be links below. And uh, coming soon, uh, the final page, right? Yep, the final page. Yep. Book, book two, the final page, coming out sometime yeah. uh, in the near future. You <laughs> December have, 2014. Believe, all right. You you have uh, approximately 7,000 projects you're working on, right? <laughs> I, I believe that's yes. somewhere in that vicinity. Exactly. All right, cool. 7,563. 
Yeah, and and if you want to uh, uh, find out more about those, there will be a link to Rebel Ragdoll uh, and and all sorts of stuff there. Colby, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, everybody, have a good day. Thanks, Michael. Burke lifted an eyebrow. So where do you stand in all of this? I stand where all Azures belong, on the side of the Order. You don't think the civilians have a right to their own governance? I think the civilians have a right to whatever they please, so long as they can keep their flock in line. They can't. So we must intervene to preserve civility. Like this? Burke motioned to the swelling aisles of laughing councilmen. You call this civility? And what would you call it? The whispers of genocide. Ah, well, so long as it merely whispers and does not scream, councilman, that's grotesque. What a strange way to categorize the very tribe to which you belong. 